All right, it is time for the Biosav Art Law, which is kind of the last nasty thing that we have to cover. And once again, as in the previous video, we're going to combine concepts and calculations into one, just because it doesn't really make sense to separate the two. All right, let's get at it. So here is the Biosav Art Law in all of its glory. If you remember back in electric situations, we had Gauss's Law, where we could calculate things pretty simply if we had a high degree of symmetry. So in magnetism we have Ampere's law that serves that purpose and when we don't have symmetry we have to do things the hard way which is with the Biot-Savart law. Similar to the way we found the total electric field by summing up all of the infinitesimal electric fields by doing kdq over r squared if you remember doing those types of problems. So a similar idea here. So if we have, instead of a long straight wire where we have a high degree of symmetry and we know that we're going to get these nice rings of magnetic field around, instead if we have some wire that's doing some skiwampus thing like this, and I want to know the magnetic field at some point P out here, in that case I need to take this wire and divide it up into infinitesimal little segments. Each of these is going to be of length dl. I'm going to have a constant current throughout the wire, so I just have i for that. And then r is going to be the distance from each location to the point P. So this is my vector r. This is my little dl vector. And I need to take uh, trying to draw a little vector in there. Anyway, I need to take the cross product of those things. So we can use a right hand rule if my DL is going to the right-ish and so I'll point my fingers that way and then uh, my palm or curl my fingers in the direction of my R vector. Then I'm going to get a magnetic field coming out of the page because my thumb is going to point in the direction of the magnetic field. The problem is when I come over here I'm going to have different angles and different magnitudes for R. So um, I'm going to have to do an integral along this line and it's not going to be pretty. Now if I'm just interested in the magnitude, this R hat vector here, that's the unit vector. Uh, essentially R vector is the magnitude of R, not vectored, times uh, the direction times R hat. So it's just the direction of our R vector. So I'm not actually crossing with the R vector, I'm crossing just with the direction of the R vector. So this thing becomes mu naught I times DL, and I don't have to have an R up here because the magnitude of this vector was 1. Uh, but I'm going to have to have a sine theta, where theta is the angle between R and DL. Uh, and I still have all this stuff in the denominator as well. So this is my magnitude expression, which is typically what we're going to be dealing with. All right, let's get to some wonderful examples. We'll start out with one where we already know the solution. We're going to find the magnetic field from a long, straight current carrying wire, something that we've looked at a couple of times. And it's going to be much, much harder with this method, but just to get you used to it, there are other instances where we can't use Ampere's law and using the Biot-Savart law isn't that bad. So let's get at it. So there's our expression, which if we write it in terms of just the magnitude for this situation, and we're going to integrate, um, I'm going to find the total magnetic field. So I'm taking the integral. I can leave all of these constants out front here. And then I'm going to, instead of having dl, since I I, my only direction is vertical. I don't have any changes in direction horizontally or in the z direction. So I can just call that dy. And then I'm just going to be interested in the magnitude at that location. So I'm just going to have my sine theta over r squared. So this is where I'm going to start. Now the trick when figuring out these integrals, I'm going to integrate with respect to y. And theta and r are not constants, so I have to change something here. I either have to write these in terms of constants and y, or I need to change my dy for d theta or dr or something like that. I, I can only have 
constants and the variable that I'm integrating with respect to. So there's a couple of different ways we can go with this. Probably the most straightforward way, which ends up with kind of an ugly integral, but since we all do them on our calculators now anyway, this is probably the simpler way to do that. I'm going to jump over here to do this. So we can say that sine of theta, where theta again is the uh, angle between dl and r, which is going to be right here. Sine of theta is going to be big R. Big R is a constant, right, because even as I take this chunk here, and I've got that as R now, big R is still going to be the same. So I've got big R over little r. I also can write little r as the square root of r squared plus y squared. So if I go ahead and make these substitutions in over here, I'm going to get that my magnetic field is mu naught over i over 4 pi and I'm left with just an R on top and an R cubed on the bottom. I guess I haven't substituted in for that yet. You just make your sine theta substitution so we don't skip too many steps. Now we can substitute in this guy. So all this junk. I know you like just watching me rewrite a bunch of constants. Anyway, uh, R on top. We can actually pull that out of the integral because it's constant. Let's go ahead and erase that over there. So we're going to have 1 over r squared plus y squared to the 3 halves power because it was cubed, but I also had a square root here. And then I just need to integrate that with respect to dy. Now the limits, we're saying this is a very long wire, so essentially negative infinity to infinity. And this integral works out to be mu naught i times r over 4 pi we're going to end up with a y over r squared times the square root of y squared plus r squared evaluated from negative infinity to infinity and this works out to be mu naught i uh, one of those cancels there, so we end up with 4 pi r. Now if we plug in our limits of integration, as y goes to infinity, the r squared doesn't matter. So this is just going to be y squared square rooted, so we're going to have y over y. So this thing is going to go to 1, and then we're going to subtract when we plug in negative infinity, and it's going to go to negative 1 because down here the infinity got squared so the negative went away and up here it didn't so we end up with this just becomes a factor of 2 which can cancel out with the 4 in the denominator and we end up with 2 pi r which is what we expected so <clears throat> pretty ugly integral but you know if you plug it in your calculator not too big a deal let me show you doing it the other way just for fun so in this case, we can say we want to get rid of this dy, so we need to get an expression for y that relates it to one of these other quantities. And we're going to say that tangent of theta equals negative r over y, or actually r over negative y. Um, we're just going to want that negative later because it'll make things to work, work out nicely. Uh, so that means that y is equal to negative r over tangent of theta, but we want dy, and everybody loves taking the derivative of 1 over tangent of theta, that works out to be r times cosecant squared theta d theta, which is equal to r d theta over sine squared theta. And then we can use the same substitution that we did earlier for sine of theta. So I'm going to squeeze this in here. We're going to get r d theta over r big R over little r squared. It's an ugly little r there. And all of this will simplify to r squared d theta over big R. Now if we substitute this up in here for dy, and then we also substitute in r over little r, uh, then we end up with our integral being mu naught i over 4 pi r 
of, oh, we're not substituting in for sine theta, that's right, because we, we're switching this to d theta. Uh, everything will cancel out, and you're just left with sine theta d theta. So again, you kind of have to pick your poison. You end up with an ugly integral, but fairly straightforward substitutions, or you do some crazy substitution stuff, and then you end up with a nice easy integral. And in this case, our angle is going to go from 0 to pi. Basically, if you move all the way down here, that angle is going to go to 0. If you move all the way up here, that angle is going to go to uh, 180 degrees, or pi. So this will evaluate again to mu naught i over 2 pi r. I'll save you some of the details there. OK, so something that could be done really easily can be done really hard with the Biosevar law. Don't we love this law? Now, here's a situation where we can't find the answer using Ampere's law. If I have a loop and I want to find the magnetic field on axis from that loop, so here we just see like half of the loop, we cut it in half, uh, but essentially you've got a loop and we want to know the magnetic field here uh, along a line going through the middle of the loop. If we tried to do this with, um, with Ampere's law, so here are the ends of my loop, I could put, in order to have some current enclosed, I could make my Amperian loop something like this, but then what's going on with my magnetic field um, as I go around this loop? Uh, well, first of all, we don't really know exactly what's going on with it, uh, but it's going to be, well, I mean, we know it's going to form some loops uh, around here and some loops around here, but the angle is going to be changing, the magnitude is going to be changing, and uh, this is going to be really nasty with Ampere's law. Now, with the Biot-Savard law, it actually works out to be kind of nice. So if we start out just thinking kind of conceptually what's going to be going on with this magnetic field, if I take the little segment of the wire at the very top here, and I take DL cross R hat, well, those are going to be perpendicular because DL is coming only in the Z direction, and R is in the XY plane, so that means that anything in the z direction is going to be perpendicular to anything that's in the xy plane. So this becomes mu naught i over 4 pi. And then we've got the uh, integral of dl over r squared. And our sine theta just becomes 1 because theta is equal to 1 because of what I just talked about. The dl is perpendicular to the r vector. So this goes to 1. So that's nice. Now the other thing is if we do our cross product to think about the direction of the magnetic field, so you're going to point your fingers back at yourself and then your palm in the direction of the R vector, then your thumb is going to be pointing off at a diagonal in this direction. Well, if you think about a magnetic field from the current at the bottom, it's going to be pointing off in some direction like this that will be symmetric to this one. So the perpendicular components, perpendicular to the axis, they will cancel out. So all we have to worry about is the horizontal components, which is nice. That means we can just take the, uh, the magnitude version of the equation because uh, they're all going to be in the same direction. So we don't need to worry about directions. Now, to get this component here, we do need to throw in a factor of cosine of phi, where we didn't want to use uh, theta again because we already used that. So I do have a cosine of phi that I have to deal with in here. And a bit of geometry can show you that that angle is equal to this same angle here because this has got to be perpendicular because this is the sum of the cross product. And so if I add uh, these angles here, this one, the 90 degree, and phi have to add up to 180. And then I've got a triangle here where I've got phi, a 90 degree angle, and this same angle, they have to add up to 180. So that means those two phi's have to be the same thing. All right, getting on with our situation here. So this is going to give me my magnetic field, right? And I can write cosine of phi from this triangle here. I can write that as big R over little r. So now I've got mu naught i 4 pi. Big R is constant. And in fact, little r is constant as well. So this makes life really good. So I've got big R over little r for the cosine. 
And then I've got another r squared here that I already had, so I'm just going to make that an r cubed. And then all I have to do is integrate with respect to dl, and that is not hard at all. I just get the circumference of that, that ring, which is going to be 2 pi times uh, big R. 2 pi big R. So I end up with mu naught i big R squared, and pi's cancel out. 2 makes that become a 2, so I've got 2 times little r cubed. And <clears throat> since we're interested in a point along the axis, usually we want to be able to plug in a value for x. And so we're going to make the same substitution that we did previously, where we can say that little r is big R squared plus x squared. I guess it's x squared this time instead of y squared. So our final expression is going to be this, which is, you know, not the prettiest expression ever, but it wasn't nearly as hard as that previous thing we did, right, to the 3 halves power. So there you have a nice equation for the magnetic field on axis from a single, uh, single ring that's carrying a current. Now you'll also notice as x is much, much larger than r, then this r doesn't matter, and so you have x squared to the 3 halves power, which is x to the uh, third power. So the magnetic field is actually inversely proportional to the distance cubed, which is an interesting situation. We'll find this <clears throat> for bar magnets as well, magnetic field to drop off as the cube of the distance. All right, let's look at one other. Oh. Let me go back to this also. Another important solution is if you plug in x equals 0, so we want to know the magnetic field right at the center of our loop there, then this thing uh, reduces to mu naught i over 2r, which is an important bit of information to know the magnetic field at the center of a current carrying loop. And that's where it's uh, at a maximum, by the way. All right, one last little example. This is another one where it's not very difficult, and if we tried to do this with Ampere's law, it would be very, very nasty. So we've got this little kind of quarter segment of a loop here, and we want to know the magnetic field right here at the middle. Well, the current coming down here, if you think about this cross product, we want uh, R is parallel to the current, and the cross product takes the perpendicular component, right? So these parallel parts don't contribute anything to the magnetic field. So all we have to worry about is the segment that is looping. And so we can say that we just need to take the integral of dB, which is going to be mu naught i over <coughs> 4 pi. Now we've got this r squared in here, but r is equal to big R, and that is constant along that loop, so we can pull this guy out, and I'm just going to go ahead and call it big R, um, because why not, doesn't matter, and then we're just left with the integral of dl, which, as you might have guessed it, we're just ending up with the magnetic field from a quarter of an entire loop, uh, but dl would give you um, pi r, sorry, 2 pi r, but we just have a quarter of a loop, so we'll do 2 pi r over 4. So that becomes a 2, that cancels there, that cancels one of there, and as you might have guessed, we get a quarter of what we had earlier. So 8 mu naught i over 8 r. And there you have it, Biot Savard Law. Hooray! We'll see you next time.